as, as we do this, I, I want to remind you of one thing, uh, which is every benevolent, every communion Sunday, we also have benevolent um, um, offering at the back that you can contribute to. We're just about depleted right at the moment because we've had so many needs. And uh, so if you would please pay particular attention to that over the next few weeks, we'd really appreciate it so we can get that fund back up. You've always been very faithful at that, and it's not a question of your faithfulness. It's a question that the needs have been uh, great. So we're grateful for those we've been able to help, but it's uh, taken us pretty low on the benevolent fund. So we urge you to help with that. Now I'm reading from Philippians chapter 2, beginning this morning in verse 25. I have thought it necessary to send to you Paphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near, near to death. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy, and honor such men, for he nearly died in the work, for the work of Christ risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Father, we thank you for this word and the challenge that it represents to us this morning. We pray that you will take these few words and help us to see the depth of meaning that is, is there and, and then to see how it applies to our own lives. And then to be obedient. We thank you for this opportunity to be together. Thank you for those who cannot be here with us this morning as they are traveling or sick or whatever the reason. We pray that you will protect them and be with them. Pray for those who are not here but should be. And ask that you will be bringing conviction into their hearts and lives. We pray, Father, for those who are in faraway places, our missionaries, those who are being persecuted for your name's sake. We ask a special, for a special blessing on all of those. Where there are financial needs, we pray that you'll meet those. Where there are needs for encouragement, that you will meet those. For courage on the part of those who have been asked to suffer jail time or perhaps in some cases even facing imminent death because they have claimed you for no other reason than that. Boy, it's, it's, it's amazing that the world in which we live can exact such a price just for naming the name of Christ, and yet it happens every single day. How we pray for these. And we thank you, Lord, that those whose lives are taken will soon be with you, and, and their trials will be over. But for many others, it's still a long haul in whatever conditions they find themselves. Pray for those who do not have your word, but they love you. They're all over the world as well. For those who have never heard your word because they do not have it available in their language. We are privileged, Father, beyond expression. And I pray that you will help us to realize that with the privilege comes responsibility and to be faithful to that. Give us now... Lord, just a measure of your heart as we look at, at this word and as we leave here, we pray that we would never leave the same as we came, but that you would change us day by day from glory to glory as you describe in 2 Corinthians. May that be our experience because we love you and follow you and give our hearts to you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. And uh, please turn with us to Philippians 2 if you're not already there. Wonderful passage of Scripture. I think it, it, it helps us see the kind of people God uses. I, you know, I think it's easy for many of us to think, well, God uses those who are great. God uses, you've got to be, you be exceptional. You've got to be adult at least. Many of our young people probably think this. 
And you know what the Bible is teaching us? None of that's true. Listen to this from 1 Corinthians chapter, and by the way, let me give you this. We're going to look at later on 2 Corinthians 12, Acts 19, Isaiah 53. Those may be places you want to turn. 2 Corinthians 12, Acts 19, Isaiah 53. But in the meantime, let me read this verse from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, where Paul says, But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God shows what is weak in the world to, change, to, to shame the strong. So in other words, God uses and chooses nobodies in order to take a message about somebody to everybody. The good news <clears throat> is that that's good news for us nobodies, right? God, God didn't choose us, see, because we were in who's who, right? Most of us weren't even in who's not. See, when he, when he chose us, he was scraping the bottom of the barrel. It would be a little bit like the Nuggets choosing me in the first round of the basketball draft, right? That would be a pretty bad choice. And yet, think of the glory that would redound if suddenly I became a great basketball player. And what God is saying here is, I'm going to take little people and I'm going to do great things with them so that I get the glory. God loves little people. God loves little people. Epaphroditus is a little person, but he's a little person who is big to God because he allowed the mind of Christ to be lived out through him. This second chapter of, of Philippians, you've noticed by now, is all about the mind of Christ and how it is to live out through us. So here's Paul under house arrest in Rome, and the Philippians get up a collection for him. Now they need somebody to take it to him and to minister to his needs there in Rome. And so they pick Epaphroditus and they send him on that 800-mile, six-week trek to this dangerous place to deliver the goods. And in addition to everything else, they took a little bit extra up so that Epaphroditus could stay with Paul and minister to him in any way that was needed. Now, Epaphroditus is not a man of notoriety, right? He's not like Timothy or Paul that we know so well. He's a little person. Epaphroditus was not the shepherd of the flock. He was not a person who wrote anything. He was just a faithful man who could be trusted with a perilous mission, a man who had the mind of Christ. He's Paul's third and last example in this chapter of what it looks like to see the mind of Christ lived out through an average person. And if Paul, who's one of those examples, shows us what it means to have self-sacrifice, and Timothy shows what it means to be able to play second fiddle, Epaphroditus is going to show us faithfulness, doing little things well. In verse 25, Paul identifies for us four roles that Epaphroditus plays, and he plays every one of them exceptionally well. Look at it again with me. He says, I have thought it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier, and your messenger to minister to my need. So let's think about how those things all played out in his life. First of all, as a brother, Epaphroditus put others above himself. Brother's a wonderful term, isn't it? Brothers, sisters in Christ. I love how the Bible uses those terms to refer to those who are Christians. He, he uses those terms because we are family. You know, John 1, 12, we learn that those who are believers in Jesus Christ, followers of Christ, are children of God. It means God is our Father in common. So he's your father, but he's my father. We have him in common as our father. That makes us brothers and sisters in Christ. We read in Hebrews 2.11, this wonderful passage where it says, For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source, God the Father. So he's saying the one who sanctifies, Jesus, and those who are sanctified, us, all have one source, God the Father, that is why he, Jesus, is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. I mean, 
This is, this is staggering language. Does it, does it get to you to imagine that Jesus is not ashamed to call you a brother or a sister? Incredible. If Jesus were to walk in here today, he'd say, Brother Mike. He'd say, Brother Jason. He'd say, Sister Janice. Jesus calls us brothers and sisters in Christ. There's no relationship physically that's stronger than that spiritual relationship that we have as brothers and sisters in Christ as part of the family of God. Jesus knew this. Jesus says in Luke chapter 18, he says, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children physically for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. Brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, there's one great thing about families. They stick together, right? They stick together. They may fight and squabble badly internally, but you just let somebody from the outside try and stick their nose into their business, right? And they're going to circle the wagons quickly. I was, in the, I was in the sixth grade, and a bunch of my brothers and I and some friends were down at the local schoolyard playing baseball one afternoon. Bunch of, bunch of, and, and, and as a sixth grader, I was about the oldest of that group. So a bunch of bunch of seventh and eighth graders came around, and began to bully us. They wanted to get into the game and uh, use our bats and our balls, and they were going to pretty well push us around. Well, as one of the oldest ones, pretty soon I was in a fairly heated verbal discussion with these guys about that, and it had just about reached critical mass when all of a sudden this huge six foot three inch, 225 pounds of solid muscle shadow fell across the playground. It was my dad. My brother, Paul, had run set record time getting the two blocks to home to grab dad, and I can still see him. I can still see him with a little bit of shaving cream on the side of his face because that's how fast he came. And those guys were out of there in no time. But this was the same brother who wouldn't hesitate at all to take a swing at me if I'd done him wrong. I guarantee you, right? That happened at our house all the time. I don't know how it is at your house. Mom used to fight it, and eventually she just said, take it outside, you know. Kill each other if you want to, but do it outside. Don't have blood on the rug. But let somebody else try and accuse somebody or take issue with something, and families circle the wagon. Families are at their best when they take care of each other, Right? And that's exactly why Paul calls Epaphroditus a brother, because he knows he has that kind of relationship with him. This is somebody who's going to watch out for him. Paul had instructed in chapter, in verse 3 of this chapter, he said, In humility count others more significant than yourselves. That is a tough assignment, but Epaphroditus was an exemplary person when it came to that. In the first place, he volunteered to take that treacherous six-week journey to get to Paul. You know, in one sense, and he didn't know exactly what he was going into, not only along the way, but once he got to Rome. Rome was not exactly the most friendly place, place to Christians in those days. Even the Christians weren't friendly to Paul when he got there, if you remember right, chapter 1. But Epaphroditus went. He, in, in a way, he kind of reminds me of the missionaries who went to Central Africa between about 1880 and 1910. Those missionaries in those days knew their chances of survival were, get this, I mean, it's an incredible number, were about one in three in the first year. One in three of them were going to die in the first year. They often took their coffins along with them when they went to Africa. I mean, that's people that are dedicated, right? That's people that are willing to put the interests of somebody else above their own, and Paphroditus was that way. He got sick. He got sick before he reached Rome in all, in all likelihood. Verse 30, it says, For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. It kind of sounds like he probably got sick and nearly died before he even got to Rome. He started out, he got sick, and then he got sicker. I'm sure that some who might have been with him were urging him to turn around and go back. But he wouldn't do it. He was determined to carry out the mission. He was determined to help Paul, putting Paul's interests above his own. 
That's the kind of man that Epaphroditus was. But when he got to Rome, and eventually he got well, then he got conflicted because he says the Philippians had heard about his illness by that time, and they were concerned. And so that now he has a concern for them. In verse 26, he was, Paul says, he's been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Now, the word distressed, you know, we kind of read over that. That is an extremely strong word that's used here. It's the same word that's used for Jesus in Gethsemane when Jesus was praying and so troubled before he went to the cross. Remember that? Distressed throwing himself on the ground, literally, bleeding great drops of blood. And it's, that's the same word that's used here for Epaphroditus. What is he doing? He's, he's acting out the role of his elder brother, right? If his elder brother did that for him, and Jesus said the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, how? By giving his life as a ransom for many. Epaphroditus says, I can do the same thing. I'll be faithful. I'll be willing to go. I will put the needs of others above my own. And so he had the needs of Paul in mind. And then later on, he had the needs of the Philippians back home in mind because they knew, he knew they were distressed about him. So the question for us by way of application in this section is what? Are we faithful brothers and sisters who put the interests above others? Uh, uh, put, put our own interests put the interests of others above our own? Or, or are we the spoiled, selfish brats in the family? Right? Every family has them, right? And we have to ask ourselves, is that who I am? Or am I truly following the example here of Epaphroditus, who was following the example of Paul, who was following the example of Jesus Christ? In the... Uh, 2012 Olympics in London, there was, there was, a, there was a runner named Ivan Ivan Fernandez. And he was running in the 3,000 steeple, 3,000 meter steeple chase. And toward the end of the race, he was running in second place. And there was quite a distance between him and the leader, a man named Abel Mutai, an African. Problem was, Mutai thought he got to the finish line. He, he misread where the finish line was. There were so many lines out there. And so he stopped about 10 meters short of the actual finish. Well, Fernandez saw that, and he realized all he had to do to win the race was just to keep on going. Nobody, nobody could fault him for that, right? He could even pretend he didn't even see Mutai. But you know what he did? He waved at Mutai, got him back on the track, got him to the finish line and pushed him ahead of himself so that he finished second. I mean, I, I, is, is that a beautiful picture of putting the interests of others above yourself? Wouldn't you want the gold medal? Wouldn't you want to... Who cares that somebody messed up and defaulted? Their fault. They should have known where the finish line was. He could have said all of those things. Instead, he pushed him on ahead. He said, I couldn't have close the gap if he hadn't made a mistake. When I saw him stopping, I knew I wasn't going to pass him. My question is this morning, who are we trying to pass? Who are we trying to be ahead of? Whose interests do we want to take second place to our own? Putting the interests of others above our own is just following the footsteps of Jesus, of Paul, of Epaphroditus. So as a, as a brother, he would put the interests of others above his own. Now how about the second one, as a worker? As a worker, what did he do? He was a fellow worker. As a worker, he finished the task. As a worker, he finished the task. That's the second thing Paul calls him, a fellow worker. And I'm sure he did that because he realized this is a guy who's not going to quit. Epaphroditus isn't going to quit. I'm happy to call him a fellow worker. Wouldn't you don't you love to work with people who you can count on, that you know they're going to finish the job, that when they make a commitment, they're going to keep it. That's the kind of people you want to work with, right? It's, one of, it's the kind of people you want to surround yourself with, and it ought to be the kind of person we want to be. People who will follow through on what we say we will do. This was Epaphroditus. And where did he get this? Again, he got this from his elder brother, right? Jesus came to earth. He had a mission. 
the mission incorporated many things that he was supposed to do. One of those, 1 John 3, 8, the reason the Son of God appeared, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. How did he do that? How did he destroy the works of the devil? He did that, of course, by dying to pay the penalty for our sin because in doing so, do you realize he obliterated the greatest he, he obliterated the greatest weapon that Satan has. Satan's name means what? Accuser. Accuser. Why is he called that? Because that's what he does. That's his career. Revelation 12, you can read about it. He stands before God and he accuses the brethren. And the problem is, what he says, he doesn't have to lie when he does that. Right? He just has to tell the truth. Look at so-and-so. Look what they did. And without the blood of Jesus to cover us, and without the righteousness of God being imputed to us because we've accepted Jesus as our Savior and Lord, without that, Satan wins in the case of that particular individual. But Jesus has destroyed that ability by dying to pay the penalty for our sins so that the Father can say, yeah, I see what they did, but they're covered by the blood of my Son, Jesus. They're forgiven. They're cleansed. I could forgive them and still be just because the price was paid. This is amazing. This is Romans 3.26. He's both just and the justifier. So in his death, Jesus killed death. He killed the power of Satan over us. Satan's, at the time of Satan's greatest victory, Jesus turned it into his greatest defeat. Listen, beloved, this is why Jesus cried out on the cross, to tell us thy, it is finished, right? Because it was finished. That was the end. You and I don't go about trying to do something to make up for the sins that we have. I mean, we're, we're lost and dead if we go for that methodology. We can't add to what Jesus has already done. When Jesus said he's, it's finished, that's what he meant. Salvation is finished. The price is paid. Everything is done. You just have to accept the gift. Do we finish the job like Jesus did, like Epaphroditus did? How many, how many, how many Christians so-called never even get in the game, let alone finish the job? Some, some of them are Christians in name only. How many are truth, tr truly faithful to the calling that God has placed on our lives? You know, individual callings, different gifts because there are different jobs to be done, but every one of us who's a Christian been given a mission of some kind. Are we finishing it? Are we even starting it? Thank God for the faithful people in our church, but are there some, some of us who still need to get in the game? There's a great story that came out of the Revolutionary War. There was a, there was a kind of an officious lieutenant one day. He's He's, he's hollering at the guys because it's raining cats and dogs. They're trying to go down, you know, this road, and they weren't paved in those days, as you know. And, and, and in addition to what they had, this particular regiment had cannons that they had to transport. And those cannons were totally bogged down in the mud. So here are the enlisted guys trying to push the cannon out, and the lieutenant is hollering at him and berating them and swearing at them and everything else. Well, about that time, a senior officer rode up. He got off his horse. He got down in the mud, rolled up his sleeves with the guys that were trying to push the can out and helped him push it out. When he got all done, he walked up to the, to the lieutenant and he said, Sir, if you ever need help again, don't hesitate to call on your commander. And then he got on his horse and rode away. The lieutenant turned to one of his friends nearby and he said, Who was that guy? You kind of reminds you, Who was that masked man, right? The guy said, That was General Washington, you fool. I hope you weren't looking for any promotion any time in the near future, right? They didn't have People Magazine and television in those days. Didn't recognize it. But I love that General Washington was a man who would get down in the dirt and get the job done, whatever the cost, right? This is why God loves little people. We must all be little people. There are no big people. There's a big God. There's a big God. So let's get in the game. Let's finish what we start. 
let's, let's one day, beloved, as a congregation, be able to stand before God in heaven and say, for that period of time, on that corner, we did the job you asked us to do. Don't we want to do that? Epaphroditus, as a worker, he finished the task. What about as a soldier? As a soldier, as a soldier, Epaphroditus was committed to the death. Committed to the death. Soldiers generally are committed. Some of them join up for other reasons. You know, they don't know what else to do with their life or something else. But generally speaking, if you join the service, you realize there's a possibility you're going to be put in a life-threatening situation. You know the risk going in. I loved, and I'm sure many of you remember that famous film, Patton, and how Patton made this great speech right at the beginning of the film. Remember, and he, one of the things he said was, the object of war is not to die for your country, but to make the other blankety-blank die for his country, right? Great line. Of course, the only issue is sometimes you do have to die for your country if you're a soldier. Sometimes that's the price that's required. And that's when Paphroditus signed on. He didn't want to die any more than the next guy. But if that's what the Lord asked, if that was the price that was laid on him, he was ready and willing and able to go. He was that dedicated. Paul says, indeed, he was ill in verse 27. He was near to death. Now, let's take a, let's take a rabbit trail here and ask an, another question. If he was near to death, why didn't Paul heal him? Why didn't Paul heal him? Didn't Paul have the power to heal him? There's no question about that. Turn with me if you've got your Bible there to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul is, in this chapter, defending his apostleship to to the Corinthians, because there have been some who have been trying to undermine his ministry there. He says in, in verse 11, kind of in the middle of the verse, in, uh, well, if I get to 2 Corinthians 12, it may look better. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11. He says in the middle of the verse, For I was not at all inferior to these super apostles, so-called, people that were coming in and trying to undermine him. I was not inferior to those super apostles, even though I am nothing. The signs of a true apostle were performed among you with utmost patience, with signs and wonders and mighty works. Those are all three words that are used for miracles all through the New Testament. Paul's saying everything that needed to be done to demonstrate that I was a true apostle, I did. Turn with me to Acts 19. Let's see this actually work, how it actually worked out. In Acts chapter 19, Paul is in Ephesus, and, it, and we read beginning in verse 11. It says, And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them. And the evil spirits came out of them. Listen, Paul unquestionably had apostolic power. He was God's chosen person for a very special task here, right? But this healing power that was evident early in his life isn't there later on. He did not heal Epaphroditus. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, which is written near the end of his life, in verse 20, he says, I left Trophimus, who was ill... At Miletus, why didn't you heal him, Paul? He tells Timothy in 1 Timothy 5.23, because Timothy had stomach problems ongoing, he says, no longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. Why didn't he heal him? In James, James says in chapter 5, verse 14, he says, is anyone among you sick? Then call the faith healer. Is that what he says? It's not what he says. He says, if any among you is sick, let him call the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Beloved, here's the issue. Miracles always had a purpose in the Bible. You don't just find random miracles going on. 
In fact, even in Jesus' case, you sometimes find him, Mark 1's a, a great example, leaving a, a major healing service to go preach somewhere else because preaching was the main aim. So what was the healing about? Well, the healing authenticated the messenger and the message. Because that's what it was always about. In the life of Christ, this was for sure the case. Jesus, uh, God tells us that in Hebrews chapter 2. That he was authenticated by the miracles that came so that people couldn't say, oh, okay, so he brought this great message, but I didn't believe it. Or oh, you didn't believe it. So what did you think about when he raised people from the dead? What did you think when he was healing people right and left? What did you think when he was casting out demons? It was authenticating. And the same was true of the apostles. That's why Paul calls it that in 2 Corinthians 12, the signs of a true apostle. It was authenticating. But beloved, even, even in this age of miracles, time of Christ and of the apostolic age. Miracles were used judiciously. Paul's comment indicates they were mainly to authenticate the apostles. And as the gospel spread, and as the word became known, and as the truths that the apostles and that Jesus had said were committed to writing, so that now we have God's word in writing, which is its own authentication. Luke 16 will show you that the miracles gradually diminished significantly. Miracles were never intended to be the main event. See, if your faith depends on miracles, guess what? You'll need another one tomorrow. That's just the way it works. One miracle is never enough. And when that miracle doesn't come, then faith diminishes. Even in another time when, when great miracles were evidenced, in the time of the deliverance from Egypt, when God did all these miracles and, and got them out of there and, and saved the, you know, did put all the, sent all the plagues and the flies and the river turning to blood, and all those kind of things were going on. And then he, then he, then he uh, divided the Red Sea so they could get across, brought it back together in time to catch the Egyptians when they tried to chase. All these miracles... So later when they get in trouble, what does, he, what does he do? More miracles? No, Jesus, in, in the, you read through the books of Numbers and Exodus and so on, and, and God says, remember what I did for you in the past. It's not a miracle a day that our faith is about. Miracles were not then and they are not now. The end all, the word is the end all. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by what? Miracles? Oh, no. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. That's the focus, and anything that takes the focus away from that is a distraction. Now, does that mean that God never heals? Please, don't go out of here and say, Dave said God never heals. I didn't say that. God does heal. Most of the time, in our age and in our time, when God heals, chooses to heal, it's providentially. That means he uses the normal course of events and the normal ways that things operate. We look at John Bonus and say, wow, there's a miracle, walking miracle, and, and he is to me. But modern medicine and other methods were used by God to bring John back to health, right? We're trusting the same for Kurt. We've seen many of you raised up from sick beds and so on. It's all a miracle, but it's a miracle of providence. Does God sometimes heal without that, heal directly? Absolutely. Some of you have seen that. I have seen that. But it's not the pattern. You know, there's a reason they're called miracles. You know, if, they, if it happened every day, we call them Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, right? They're, they're miracles because they don't happen every day. Especially, so should we pray for them? Absolutely. Is there anything wrong with that? No. But you say, but you know, wait a minute. I, 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 this is wrong because I, you know, I know it says that by his stripes we are healed. It says that. Well, let's look at that. It's in Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. This is quoted so often by people totally out of context. Isaiah 53. And verse 5, this whole passage is about the crucifixion of Christ written 800 years before the fact. It reads like a New Testament document. It's an amazing prophecy that God gave to Isaiah. But he says in verse 5, 
but he was wounded for our transgressions, pierced for our transgressions. In the King James, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquity. Upon him was the chastisement that brought his peace, and with his stripes we are healed. Do you see what's going on there? He's not talking about physical healing. What's he talking about? He's talking about peace with God. He's talking about our spiritual death problem is healed by the death of Jesus Christ. All we like sheep in the next verse have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. It's about the iniquity problem. It's about the sin problem. It's about the guilt problem that we are healed by his stripes. Now listen carefully to this, because part of the package that we get when we get salvation also includes physical healing, but that's not promised in this life. In fact, it never happens in this life. You say, what do you mean? Well, every faith healer that I've ever known died. You ever notice that? They all die. Why? Because that's not the promise. The promise is in Philippians 3.20. If you just turn over from where we are in Philippians 2, and you'll find out that our citizenship is in heaven, from which we wait for the revelation of Jesus Christ, at which time we will have a body just like his body. Philippians 3.21, he will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. When does that happen? At the time of the second coming. We're either brought out of the grave and given this new body, or if we've died before, we're given that new body as we, or, or if we're still on earth, we're given that new body as we rise to, to meet him in the air. I hope this helps because this is a very confusing area for so many people. Pray for whatever God asks you to pray for, but beloved, he never gives us the right to demand. We are, we are when we pray, we are submitting to his greater will because it will always, he always knows better than we. And often God is far more glorified by our suffering than he is by our being made well. To suffer well is one of the things that Christians through the ages have done that has brought millions of people to faith in Jesus Christ because they don't have any answer for that. That's why Paul says in Philippians 1, 29, he says, For it has been granted to you, graced to you literally, given to you as a gift of grace, that you for the sake of Christ should not only believe in him, so we like that, but also suffer for his sake. It's a gift. Suffering is a gift. It's a privilege that good soldiers are committed to. <laughs> they don't go out and look for it. Typically, they don't ask for it, although Paul did. He said, I want to know Jesus, and I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings. I haven't quite reached that point yet. It's a gift. God sometimes asks us to endure. Now, God eventually healed Epaphroditus, but not miraculously. He did it through the normal course of events. Meantime, he soldiered on. He soldiered on. Paul elaborates in verse 30, he says, For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Risking. He didn't get healed right away. He was risking his life to keep going, but he kept going. The word there, risking, is, the, is a Greek word, parabalumi, parabalumi. There were some people later on, some Christian people, who took the name upon themselves of Parabolomai, because that word parabolomai means to throw aside. It means to throw caution to the wind. It was used of gamblers. And these later Christians took on the name the gamblers. <laughs> We're the gamblers. Why? Because they would go out and minister to people that no, they'd go places where no one else would go. Places that, like prisons and, and places where there, were, where there were plagues. They would go out and try and help the people that were in trouble. They were the gamblers. They were the risk takers for the sake of Christ. Just, just one example, and I could mention hundreds of these that you could find in the history books, but in Carthage, city of Carthage in, in North Africa in 252, there was a great plague that swept the city. And Cyprian, who was the pastor there, he took many of his church people, he led them to go out the inhabitants of the city wouldn't even, they wouldn't even touch the dead bodies to bury them. Cyprian took the church people out and they, and they ministered to the people who were sick and dying. 
And they would bury them when they were needed. Now, some of them died as a result. Some of them didn't. But the point was they were willing to go where the ministry was needed because they were good soldiers of Jesus Christ, trusting in him. Soldiers implies battle, doesn't it? We've kind of lost our wartime mentality in 21st century America. We've just had it good for so long. Comfort is our game. But war means sacrifice. We're in spiritual warfare, Paul says in Ephesians 6.12. So we should expect there's going to be some price to pay. There's going to be some cost that attached to being a disciple. You know, warfare means sacrifice. You know, we look at the the, guy, the 56 guys that signed the Declaration of Independence, they're our heroes, right? We look at them and we think, what great guys these were, and we should. We revere them. You know what happened to those guys? 56 of them? Let me give you a little bit of a rundown. Five were captured, tortured, and then killed by the British. Twelve had their homes ransacked and burned. Two of them lost sons who were fighting in the war. The other one lost two sons who were POWs. Nine fought and died in the war themselves. One of them named Braxton Carter was a very wealthy. A lot of these guys were pretty wealthy in, in, in those days. They knew what was on the line when they signed up for this. Braxton Carter, he owned a big plantation there in Virginia. He was a tradesman. All of his ships were burned by the British. He lost everything that he had. He lost his home. And eventually he died bankrupt. Thomas Nelson lived down in Virginia. Cornwallis, General Cornwallis, the British general, took over his, his home in the last battle of the war. And Nelson came to Washington and insisted that he bombard it, which he did. His home was destroyed. He died bankrupt. John Hart was driven away from his wife's deathbed by the British. His 13 sons, had to, 13 children had to scatter through the woods in the brush as the British were coming, as did he. Later on when he came back home, his wife was dead. He didn't know where his kids were, and some of them he never did find. He died bankrupt. Beloved, this is the cost of warfare. And we're in a spiritual warfare. We must expect that there's going to be a little bit of pain and suffering along the way. But it's, it's a wonderful thing because we're able to do this out of love for our Savior. To fill up what is lacking, Paul says in Colossians 1.24, of the suffering of Christ. I don't know where your suffering is. I don't know whether it's something physical that God has asked you to endure. I don't know whether it's family problems. You know, children that have strayed from the Lord. The suffering takes many different forms. But we need to embrace God in all of that and say, whatever, whatever the price is you're asking me to pay, I'm willing to pay it. I want to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Gamblers, for the sake of Jesus, like Epaphroditus, like Paul, like Jesus. Finally, as a minister, Epaphroditus deserved honor. Paul wanted to send Epaphroditus home for his sake and for that of the Philippians. But it seems like he must have feared a little bit that they might think Epaphroditus was remiss in coming home that, that quickly. For some reason, at least, he was concerned a little bit about how they would receive him. So his parting comment there in verse 29 is, he says, So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men. I love how he says that. Don't don't just receive him, receive him with joy. And don't just receive him with joy, honor him. And don't just honor him, honor everybody there that's like him. Little people doing little things in a fine way for a great God. Honor those whenever you can find them. All the, all the honor eventually goes to the Lord, right? We know that. We know that. Anything we get right as a Christian is credit to him. Anything we get wrong, we get responsibility for, right? It's just the way it is. The Lord should be honored. The Lord should be glorified. But we can honor those who are doing things well, but please, not cult heroes, please. 
you know, we have so, no celebrities, we have so adopted the world's celebrity culture in the church. We reached the point that rather than open a new church, we put a, you know, we put on the big screen, whoever the, you know, whether it's Matt Chandler or Tim Keller or Bill Hybels or whoever it is, not going to be Bill anymore, but, you know, we do those things because we have this celebrity culture, and, I, and I'm picking on any of those people that are wonderful guys, but, but that's not what the Lord's looking for. He's looking for little people who will do little things in a fine way for a great God. And when we find those people, we need to honor them. Not make cult figures out of people, but honor those who are truly committed to the Lord. Find the contributions. Tell them thank you. Give them honor. Epaphroditus lived out the mind of Christ, didn't he? Little person, doing a little job in a fine way for a great God. He was faithful at any cost as a brother, as a worker, as a soldier, as a minister. Let me ask you this question in closing. Did you ever hear of Ed, Edward Kimball? I'm guessing you never heard of Edward Kimball. Some of you are here today because of Edward Kimball. Edward Kimball was, he was just a simple, he was a simple uh, shoe store salesman, really. He just tried on shoes for people in Chicago in the middle of the 1800s. But he also taught a Sunday school class. And in his free time, he used to go out and, and try to get some of, the, you know, some of the street urchins that were around the area in, in central Chicago to come to his Sunday school class, drum up business for teachers like that, right? This is what he did. Well, he had one boy who would typically come to class, and he, he was one of these little guys that he just got off the street, no parents that were involved, but he would come. But then he would sleep through class. Every once in a while, he'd cause some problems. And so Kimball decided he, made, he was going to make a deal out of this kid, and he went to, he went to where the, the boy was working at that point in time, and he asked him, don't you want to come to faith in Christ? And the kid told him no, and Edward Kimball walked away thinking he had failed again. But you know who that kid was? And he began to think, if a guy came to find me, not just bring me to a Sunday school class, but he, he loved me enough to come and search me out. Maybe there is something to this. And he came to faith in Christ. And even though he had very little education, he became the greatest evangelist of the 19th century, D.L. Moody. He was brought to faith by Edward Kimball. But that's not the end of the story. D.L. Moody went to London later on when he was pretty famous as an evangelist, and he began to preach there. And there was a guy named F.B. Meyer who already was a pastor, but he was an, edu he was an elite guy. He was educated. And when he heard D.L. Moody's kind of, you know, home homely illustrations and his language, it wasn't always completely grammatically correct. He thought, this is weird. I don't care much for this. But as he came back night after night... The Lord got a hold of his heart, and he realized the power that was here in Moody, and it changed his ministry completely. And, and, and eventually, Moody asked F.B. Meyer to come to the United States and, and, and do some preaching. And while F.B. Meyer was in the United States, he was preaching one day, and he says, he, sa he, sa he kind of made this comment. He said, if you're not willing, are you at least willing to be made willing? And sitting in the audience the day that he said that was a young man named Wilbur Chapman. Chapman gave his heart to Christ, and Chapman became a great evangelist. And Chapman began to go around preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And one of the people that he eventually led to Christ was a baseball player named Billy Sunday, who became one of the great evangelists of the early 20th century. And Billy Sunday went around preaching evangelistic services in a lot of places and with great success. And he got to Charlotte, North Carolina on one occasion, and he was preaching, and then he had to move on to another place. But the meetings were going so well, they decided we need to get somebody else in here. So they called a guy named Mordecai Ham to come in and replace him so that the meetings didn't have to stop. And Mordecai Ham came. And a young man from a farm nearby came with one of his friends, a 16-year-old Billy Graham. Came to faith in Christ. Beloved, you may not know Edward Kimball, but God knows Edward Kimball. God knows him very well. God loves little people. 
God loves little people who will be faithful. Little people like Epaphroditus. Little people who will take on whatever it is the Lord sends their way with a spirit of humility, with a spirit of sacrifice, with a spirit of faithfulness. Let's be those little people. Father, thank you for your, for your mercy, your grace, your patience. We are... We are very aware of all the times that we fail. And Lord, I pray you'll also make, make us aware of the times when we really have been faithful. Help us not to be discouraged. Help us to grasp onto the fact that in you there is mercy and there is grace and there is power to sustain us. Help us to realize that you love little people who will be trying. You love little people who will work at it. Love little people who have your best interests at heart. May we please be those little people. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.